सर कैंडली शेयर योर स्लाइड्स वी वांट टू चेक एक्चुअली Can you uh, can you move ahead the slides? A uh, few slides. We want to check that if the slides are going ahead or not. Can they work. Uh, great, sir. Great, sir. Welcome back, everyone. Now we have our second keynote talk entitled Symbolic, Statistical, and Causal AI by Professor Bernhard Skolkoff of Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, Germany. And to chair the session, I would like to request Professor Arup Ghosh of Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, to please come up on stage and chair the session for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be here and chair this session, uh, which is going to be delivered by Bernhard Kolkoff. And uh, my training is not in artif artificial or machine intelligence. I am from the statistics and mathematics background and probability. Uh, but I have seen some of the videos of video lectures of Professor Kolkoff, and I can guarantee you that you are uh, in for an uh, interesting. One hour. So, uh, Professor Bernard Skolkov's scientific interests are in machine learning and causal inference. He has applied his methods to a number of different fields, ranging from biomedical problems to computational photography and astronomy. Bernard studied physics and mathematics and earned his PhD in computer science in 1997 and then becoming a Max Planck director in 2001. He has co received the Berlin. Brandenburg Academy Prize, the Royal Society Milner Award, the Leibniz Award, the BBA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award, and the ACM AAAI Allen Newell Award. He's a fellow of the ACM and of the CIFR pro <laughs> program Learning in Machines and Brains, a member of the German Academy of Sciences, and a professor of ETH Zurich. He helped start the MLSS series of machine learning seminar schools, the Cyber Valley Initiative, the Ellis Society, and the Journal of Machine Learning Research, an early developed in open access, and today, of course, the field's flagship journal. So it's a great honor and a pleasure to welcome Professor Sholkov to deliver his talk. Professor Sholkov. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, speak here today in Kolkata even if it's just virtually. Uh, so I hope you can hear me well. <clears throat> if not, please interrupt. I uh, hope you can see me well and uh, I look forward to giving this talk and to the discussion afterwards. <clears throat> well, I want to start in the year, year 1958, uh, which is when the New York Times reported on a new machine, which was called the Perceptron, uh, reporting on a press conference that uh, Frank Rosenblatt uh, had uh, used to present the perceptron. And Rosenblatt said that uh, the perceptron would be the first machine to think as the human brain and uh, learn to learn from experience. And he also predicted that later perceptrons should be able to recognize people and even translate language, uh, which must have sounded fantastic at the time. And this was the beginning of what we call neural networks or connectionism. Uh, but interestingly, at the same time, uh, there was another equally revolutionary development uh, in what we now call computer science. And, and that was the understanding that computers can do more than just compute with numbers. Uh, computers can process symbols. And this uh, idea was so successful that people felt that it's probably going to be enough even for 
generating artificial intelligence. So they thought that uh, uh, if we come up with the right algorithms in the, with the right symbols, then we can apply these algorithms, these rules to process symbols and generate intelligent uh, behavior. <laughs> At the time, this was the most successful paradigm. It was really the starting point of computer science, uh, and it also dominated the field of artificial intelligence for quite some time. So it was so successful that one of the fathers of that field, uh, Herb Simon, uh, uh, said in 1956 that machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a, a human can do. Now, uh, this was fueled by initial successes, uh, promising successes, for instance, uh, when it comes to automatic uh, theorem proving or uh, computer chess, um, uh, which is shown in this picture here. But uh, uh, soon people noticed there was something paradox going on. And this was uh, stated explicitly by Hans Moravec. Uh, and the paradox that he uh, formulated essentially said that the Easy problems are very hard, but the problems that looked hard are surprisingly easy. So problems like chess or mathematics was surprisingly easy or comparably easy for AI. Uh, but problems like looked easy, uh, like including most of the things that animals can do or things like moving a chess piece turned out hard. So even, even so much so that uh, when uh, Deep Blue uh, beat Garry Kasparov, yeah, on the side of the table where it said deep blue, there was actually not deep blue sitting, but there was a human sitting because deep blue didn't know how to move chess pieces. So this paradox stayed with us for quite some time. And uh, we entered what was later referred to as the AI winter. So AI didn't deliver on its promises and uh, the methods of classical AI became out of fashion. The conferences that had their heydays uh, uh, in the late 80s uh, became smaller. Uh, classic AI conferences. Uh, but then what happened surprisingly was that, that this other field that was founded by uh, Rosenblatt, uh, which had a somewhat different culture, uh, which had uh, been less popular uh, than uh, symbolic AI for quite some time, this other field went through the roof. And uh, with this other field, we can now solve also problems that looked easy, but are actually hard, such as uh, playing table tennis. So this is now a system from, from my lab. It's a, a video from uh, maybe two years ago, uh, where we show that we can use machine learning to learn uh, uh, to uh, uh, control this rather difficult to control robot, highly nonlinear with pneumatic muscles uh, and hit table tennis balls. So that's an encouraging success. I want to show another encouraging success, uh, but then I want to talk about the problems of uh, today's AI, uh, i.e. of machine learning. So the other encouraging thing that I wanted to show is a, a recent application that we had in the field of physics, in particular in the field of gravitational wave inference. Uh, as you know, there are now uh, these gravitational wave observatories in different places of the world. Uh, they essentially, uh, uh, they are interferometric devices that use long distances to measure tiny, minute uh, uh, distortions of space. So uh, distortions of the very notion of length uh, as uh, uh, gravitational waves propagate through our planet or through the universe. So these are very tiny distortions. They are very small compared to the noise level. So these are distortions on the order of the uh, uh, of the size of a, a nucleus of an, of an atom. So there are tiny uh, effects, uh, very noisy. And uh, what we've done in this project here together with physicists was that we trained a system uh, that takes as inputs these measurements and then produces as outputs a posterior distribution over the physical parameters of the system that we're observing. Uh, so this includes, for instance, the masses. So typically uh, the event that we're observing or the only cases where anything can be measured at all uh, are dramatic uh, uh, event involving huge masses, for instance, two black holes merging into one. And um, this is a dramatic event where just before the merger at the end, uh, they orbit each other uh, tens or even hundreds of times a second, uh, and they're heavier than the sun. Uh, so these are dramatic events, some of them so loud that you could have measured them no matter where in the universe they took place. Given the measurements, we want to infer the masses. We want to infer where in the sky they took place, etc. And uh, uh, classical methods that use simulation for what simulation, Markov chain, Monte Carlo methods, 
uh, took uh, hours or days for this kind of uh, analysis, which is a problem because in some cases uh, you would like to do follow-up observations with telescopes, what, uh, what you can see in that area, in particular if it's not black holes merging but uh, uh, neutron stars merging. So you want to be able to do this fast. Uh, so here we used machine learning to train systems that estimate the distribution, for instance, of the location, but also of the other parameters uh, within seconds uh, as accurately as the other methods uh, uh, did within hours or days. Um, so machine learning is great, but machine learning can also go wrong. And whether it goes wrong, has to do with implicit assumptions, uh, in particular, the assumption of independent and identically distributed data that I'm sure you're all aware of or familiar with. So that's the assumption that uh, the training data comes from the same distribution, in particular, that the training data comes from the same distribution as the test data. So between training and test, the world doesn't change. So you could say but machine learning allows us to predict the future, provided the future looks the same as the past. But if the future looks different from the past, then all bets are off. And uh, this is a nice example where people had uh, they had trained systems to detect uh, what's called a pneumothorax uh, when one or two of the, the uh, wings of the lung uh, collapses. Uh, this gets treated uh, in particular by inserting a little tube in the lung so the liquid can flow out. Um, and uh, what they did is they trained systems to do this automatically to class to, sorry to classify automatically whether a person suffers from a pneumothorax uh, given uh, X-ray images. Uh, they uh, achieved a very high performance, but they noticed that on the, a test set of new uh, images of new patients coming in, it didn't work. And when they analyzed uh, how the system worked, they noticed that the system was essentially just looking at whether uh, this little tube had been inserted in the lung because in all the training images of the patients with the pneumothorax, uh, they had already inserted that tube. And of course, uh, with new people coming in, if you want to use this as a diagnostic tool, you don't know yet uh, whether they have a pneumothorax so you haven't yet inserted this tube. So uh, uh, clearly this seems to be a system that then was trained on a feature that is correlated uh, in a certain population with whether there's a pneumothorax. Uh, but it's not causal for the pneumothorax, and it's been very misleading in this case. Um, the second phenomenon that I believe also many of you may have heard of is this phenomenon of adversarial vulnerability. So in this phenomenon, you take a machine learning system that was trained uh, on a certain task, uh, in, for instance, to recognize objects and animals. And uh, in this case, uh, it successfully recognized this little uh, piglet, uh, but if you add a little bit of malicious noise and it's a, it's a noise that was optimized given knowledge of the classifier, you add a little bit of malicious noise, the image still looks the same to a human, but the system now uh, classifies it confidently as an airplane. Now, this is also a problem uh, uh, of uh, the, the violation of the IID assumption because our, our systems are highly optimized to a given distribution. And uh, if we then make slight uh, uh, interventions, slight distortions, we are now generating an image that comes from a slightly different distribution. And in this case, uh, that is already enough uh, to fool the system. Now, I've already uh, used the word causal before. I think we all know that causality has something to do with uh, statistics and with correlation, but we also know that it's not the same as correlation. Now, in which sense does causation uh, differ from correlation? So one of the first persons to uh, think about this problem was the, uh, the philosopher and natural scientist uh, Hans Reichenbach, uh, originally from Germany, a very interesting character. He did his uh, PhD thesis on foundations of probability. It took him quite a while to find a professor who would give him a PhD for this, but then subsequently, he was hired uh, to a physics department uh, in Berlin by uh, Max Planck, uh, von Laue and Einstein. Um, he had to leave Germany because he was uh, of Jew partly of Jewish ancestry. He went to uh, Turkey and then later to America where he founded a famous philosophy school at UCLA. And uh, uh, in America, he wrote a book uh, called The Direction of Time. And in this book, he uh, uh, postulates uh, the common cause principle. And this common cause principle uh, says 
that if we find uh, or if we observe that there are two variables uh, that are correlated in the world, then there must be a causal explanation for this. And the causal explanation uh, in the generic case would be that there's something else that causally influences both of them. Now, uh, this something else could coincide with either X or Y. So these two graphs over here are special cases of this one, if you want. Um, so for instance, if we observe that the frequency of storks and the human birth rate uh, are correlated, so this uh, is the, seems to be the case, or it was the case in some data sets of European countries, and I don't know if this is also a sort of a, a myth in India, but there's this story that the storks bring the babies. Um, so if you find these quantities to be correlated, then uh, the explanation could be that the storks bring the babies. It could also be that the babies attract the storks, maybe with their loud shouting. Uh, or it could be that there's something else that causally influences both of these uh, observables, uh, for instance, economic development. And uh, based just on the observations of the storks and the babies, we cannot distinguish between the three. So we can get the same joint distribution over these two variables uh, from all three cases. Um, but uh, 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 so what's important now is that uh, for machine learning, as long as we're in an IID setting, uh, this distinction doesn't matter. So we could take the frequency of storks and uh, use it to train uh, and the frequency of, of, uh, uh, of the human birth rate. And then we could, we could uh, uh, train a machine learning system to uh, classify or to predict the, uh, the uh, frequency of uh, human birth, so human birth rate from a number of storks. And it would probably, or it would do better than chance because there is a correlation. Uh, however, that system would probably not transfer to other continents where the relationships are different. So it would not be a stable relationship. And also it will not predict the effect of interventions. So if we were to artificially increase the number of storks, uh, then that system might maybe tell us, oh, it seems like we should now get more babies, which of course is misleading. And the reason is that the system has no, it just models a statistical relationship in one data set. It has no understanding of the causality and no robustness in terms of transfer, no robustness in terms of predicting the effect of interventions. So these are two issues, transfer and interventions, where statistical learning alone is not enough. Now, if we uh, say statistical learning is not enough, then of course, uh, uh, what I would like to suggest is that we have to think about uh, causal forms of machine learning. So what uh, what kind of desiderata should causal machine learning satisfy? So first of all, it should give us a certain form of out of distribution generalization. So it, we would like the systems to generalize even if the IID assumption is not violated. So the IID assumption has been has been called the big lie of machine learning. In practice, we never have IID data. The uh, causal machine learning should support uh, working with multiple environments, ideally also multiple tasks. It should be sample efficient because it should be able to transfer uh, uh, information from one setting to another one. Uh, so it should adapt fast. It should support lifelong learning. So the kind of learning that we see in animals and humans where we don't get a new data set for every task that we have to solve. Um, it should be interventional. So it should make predictions about interventions. It should therefore allow planning. It should, uh, should allow explanation in terms of uh, hypothetical interventions. It should allow credit attribution, uh, backtracking uh, what has happened and then assigning credit to actions in the past. So all these things that uh, uh, commonly we would subsume under the vague term of thinking um, in addition uh, to the out of distribution generalization, we, what we would also like to see, and what hasn't been discussed much in the field, is something that we could call out of variable generalization or marginal generalization. So uh, that refers to the setting where we we may not have observations of the joint distribution of all the variables in question, but at any given point in time, we might might just see. Uh, observations of certain marginals. So a few variables together, and tomorrow I'll see a few other variables together. And then the question is, how can I put this together in my head to make an overall model? 
So one could even go so far as to say that this is the second ply of machine learning. We never really get to see all the variables at the same time, but we we, we see different different views, uh, different marginals of a, a hypothetical joint distribution that we maybe can never sample from. Uh, and maybe I'll mention this later. Now, <clears throat> I like to think overall uh, of this situation as a spectrum uh, or a taxonomy of different forms of modeling. And uh, in this spectrum, um, one can include many more, but in a very rough uh, form, we could say this spectrum uh, starts from differential equation models, which is the gold standard, which is what, what physicists like to uh, put together. Um, and uh, at the other end, we have statistical models, so models that merely uh, find patterns, that find regularities, that exploit correlations and uh, uh, dependencies. And in between, we have causal models, which have some properties from both sides. Now, statistical models are great when it comes to the IID setting. I hope I've explained that. Um, they can generalize within the IID setting. We even have guarantees when they can generalize and under which conditions we have statements about universal consistency. So we have algorithms for which we know they will give us in the limit the best possible result uh, that also humans cannot beat, given the same information. Um, but these systems, as I've also argued, they are uh, potentially useless when it comes to predicting under shifts and interventions. They often don't give us real physical insight. Uh, they are not useful thing for thinking and reasoning. But the great thing is we know how to learn them from data. Now, a differential equation model, on the other hand, uh, is hard to learn from data. Usually, uh, it requires a smart scientist to come up with the right differential equation model for a problem. Um, but in principle, if we get them, they allow us to do anything we want to do. They are like the best description of a system that we can give in terms of mathematics, um, loosely speaking. Now, a causal model is somewhere in between. Uh, it allows IID prediction. It also allows uh, prediction under shift in interventions. Uh, one can argue that it gives us more insight. Uh, it supports thinking, reasoning. And the hard question is how to learn them from data. Under which conditions can we learn causal models from data? So this is something that I would like to uh, talk about in much of the rest of, the, of this lecture. And uh, and I would also like to talk about how these different levels are related to each, each other. So what does one level tell us about the other one? How do we how do we bridge these this hierarchy? Uh, so for instance, uh, given a set of ordinary differential equations, how do we get to a causal model? So if we had a, a, a generic set of differential equations of this form here uh, with an initial value, so that's an initial value problem. And then uh, there's a famous theorem of Picard and Dindelof that tells us that if this function here is well behaved, then uh, so it satisfies a certain uh, continuity or smoothness assumption, uh, then there exists a unique solution, x of t, um, that uh, I think in an open set containing uh, this initial value, which means that in particular, uh, the immediate future, of course, also the immediate past, but let's focus on the future. The immediate future of X is implied by its past. Now, if we rewrite this thing in terms of differentials, uh, then we can equivalently write it in this form. And in this form, uh, you can you could just read off how the future values of your uh, vector of observations is related to which uh, which parts of its past. So it tells us which entries of X of T have a causal influence on, uh, on which other entries at the point in the future. So if this differential equation truly describes the, the physical causal structure, then you could say this then gives us a graph that we can write down that describes this causality. Now, uh, often, now this, of course, is now still a temporal, it's a, it's a graph in time. So it gives us a complicated temporal structure of causality, uh, which might change over time, etc. Sometimes we want an atemporal statement. Uh, and then we're interested in the question how to get from differential equations to non-temporal causal models. And I don't have time to go into this, but there are some, we, and we, we've also done some works on this, uh, for instance, uh, if we're interested in the problem where uh, 
we have an ODE system that is in an equilibrium state that satisfies certain stability conditions and we perturb it a little bit and then we ask how do the variables now change given this perturbation uh, so there are there's work on this it's also related to the issue of cost grading um, but I don't want to go into details on this so I just want to give you a flavor of how the different levels are related uh, the next uh, 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 connection interesting connection is the connection from a causal model to a statistical model so this has been studied in great detail in the history of causality research and this is also how we got into this field so what is a causal model what is a so-called structural causal model so in a structural causal model we have a set of observables and we assume they lie on the vertices or they form the vertices of a directed acyclic graph so it's a graph with directed arrows and without loops. The arrows represent direct causation. And uh, in the model, we assume that each variable, so think of this green one here, is a function, a deterministic function of its parents. So P, A, I, so the red ones are the parents. And in addition of a noise variable. So the noise variable is not shown here, but that's how the whole thing becomes random. So this is deterministic, but there's a noise. Now, we assume that uh, the noise variables are jointly independent. So why do we assume this? Well, if, if there were dependencies amongst the noise variables, then by the Reichenbach principle, we would say, well, it looks like there's another variable that causes both of them. And then we really should make a bigger graph that includes that other variable. So the assumption of having independent noises really corresponds to saying that the graph that we are considering is large in that, enough such that the noises that sort of drive this uh, model are independent and there's no interesting causal structure outside that we should be modeling. Now, now what is interesting about this, uh, this model, if we specify the distributions of these noise variables, so separately because they factorize, um, and then we uh, uh, substitute into these equations, uh, then we get a unique joint distribution because there are no loops. And uh, this joint distribution, interestingly, uh, has a certain uh, independent structure that uh, carries information about the graph. So it turns out that this joint distribution, which we call the observational distribution, satisfies uh, the, the statement that uh, conditioned on its parents, so, uh, uh, so this variable, or any such variable, when conditioned on its parents, it becomes independent of its non-descendants. So non these are the descendants and non-descendants is anything that's not a parent or a descendant. So that is something that's interesting and it's something that we can test in principle based on data. It's a hard problem to test this, but in principle we can do it. Uh, unfortunately, we can only do it if we have at least three variables because uh, a conditional statement uh, uh, always connects at least three random variables. So if we have only two, uh, we're stuffed, but I'll come back to the two variable problem in a minute. Uh, before doing so, I want to say that um, this joint distribution equivalently actually uh, can be uh, written in a particular type of factorization where here we have conditionals of, of, so for each variable, we have one term in this factorization and this term is the conditional of the variable given its parents. That's a particularly nice factorization because the parents might be just a few, even if the graph is large. So that's in a way, if you want, that is a relatively low dimensional description of the joint distribution. And uh, and this model, uh, what is nice about this model, so it, it gives us all of statistics, if you want. It gives us any possible joint distribution, but it gives us more because um, in this representation, we can also say what happens if there are interventions, what happens if we change one of those variables, or what happens if we change uh, one of those mechanisms, one of those functions. Now, uh, I'll come back to the two-variable case. So this is um, really what intrigued us when we got into this field about uh, 10 years or, so, or a little more ago, um, 15 years ago. Um, we thought intuitively there are cases where we think the problem can also be solved if we just have two variables. Uh, and we wanted to do, uh, provide a toy example why, why that makes sense and what kind of assumption you need. And uh, we came up with an assumption that we call independence of, of uh, causal mechanisms. Or in the two variable case, which we're considering here, uh, it's just an independence of the cause distribution and of the conditional of effect given cause. And let's make it even simpler. 
let's say the conditional effect given cause has no noise. So it's just a function that translates uh, the cause into an effect. So that means we have a distribution over the cause variable. We have a mechanism. So that's our conditional f of x. And then that implies a distribution of the effect variable. Now, what's interesting is if this uh, mechanism is non-trivial, so if this is more than just a straight line, so let's say this is a nonlinear function, it has some flat area, then these flat areas will imply that the density of the output variable is larger in those areas where we have the flat thing. So that means the output distribution carries a certain footprint of the mechanism. And more specifically, if we make the assumption that the mechanism distribution, uh, sorry, that the cause distribution uh, knows nothing about the mechanism so that these two things are independent in ways that can be formalized, then uh, we can show that the independence between the effect distribution and the inverse mechanism uh, is violated. So that so that the system becomes re uh, irreversible. So we can't just say, no, in fact, y was the cause and x is the effect because this is an invertible function. That is not true because then the independence between this and this would be violated. And um, one possible formalization uh, uh, is written here. I won't go into details on it. I think you, you got the basic idea. Uh, and for this formalization, we can prove that the corresponding quantity in the backward direction uh, will be strictly violated, will be strictly non-zero, uh, as long as the function, the mechanism is not the identity. Now, uh, that's interesting, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But before doing so, because I will come back with an example from physics, before doing so, I want to tell you that uh, this is not the only possible ways. Uh, 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 starting from a structural cause and model, you don't necessarily have to become to move to a statistical model. You could also say, I'll start with a structural cause and model, and I derive an algorithmic model. So a model where uh, we are not using uh, 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 random variables and Shannon information and mutual information, et cetera, to measure dependencies, but a model where we use uh, something called Kolmogorov complexity or, or so-called algorithmic information. Uh, and in this model, it's this is a, a model of computation rather than uh, just of functions connecting random variables, uh, statistical variables. So in this case, we assume that every for every node, um, there's a, a program that computes the value of that node from the values of its parents uh, uh, running on some Turing machine. And, uh, uh, um, and there's a, and the program, uh, the program is now takes the role of what previously was the noise. So there's a program that runs here and computes given it the parents, the values of this. Um, and now we have to make an assumption. So we, before we had an assumption that the noises were jointly independent. So in this case, we have to make the assumption that uh, the noises are jointly independent in the sense of uh, uh, compression. So uh, these uh, these uh, 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 these quantities, these programs, they're all bit strings now. Uh, these bit strings should be not jointly compressible better than the sum of the individual compressions. That's uh, the generalization of independence to this setting. Now, if we make this assumption, then it turns out we also get a causal Markov condition like before. So it's also the same kind of conditional independence statement, just like before. And we also get uh, uh, corresponding to this uh, factorization of the joint distribution, we get a decomposition of the joint complexity. So that's, uh, you don't have to follow it in detail, but there's a, a, a very strong analogy. And uh, Turns out if we now make uh, the independence assumption that we made before, so independence between cause and mechanism, uh, and we make it an example of physics, and then we can derive something rather fundamental in physics, uh, which is the second law of thermodynamics. So the statement that entropy, uh, 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 the entropy of a system uh, cannot decrease by a sort of physical time evolution. And, uh, and we can... And that's a paradox in physics because uh, time evolutions in physics are typically reversible. So in quantum mechanics, the time evolution is unitary, so it's reversible. So where does this asymmetry of uh, thermodynamics come from? And here uh, we, we will argue that it actually comes from an independence assumption. So let's assume we have our cause. In this case, uh, we have a set of particles that fly towards some object. 
we have an incoming beam. Let's say this is uh, some light shining at this object. Then we have a scattering mechanism. So the object reflects some of these uh, photons or particles. Uh, we think of this as our mechanism. And then we have the outgoing beam. Uh, and that's the thing that we photograph because uh, like we don't see the objects themselves. We just see uh, what they do to photons when we shine light on them. Um, and that's the effect. And of course, the effect, we are used to the fact that the effect contains information about the object. That's how photography works. That's why on pictures we see something. We think we see the object. Um, and we, it shows the object in the past. So photographs show, show us the past. Uh, so where does the asymmetry come from? So uh, uh, let's do it as follows. So uh, we, we are going to, as, uh, so the asymmetry comes from the fact that this uh, initial state, the cause, has no information about the object. So the object and the cause are independent, uh, but the same is not true for the effect and the object because the effect contains information about the object. Uh, that's how photography works. So we are going to more generally make the assumption that the initial state of a physical system and the system dynamics are independent in the sense of Kolmogorov complexity. So we'll say that the uh, if I concatenate the two and I uh, compress the description of the union of both, uh, I will get a description uh, which is a, a not shorter than the sum of the individual compressions. So that's the definition. And uh, uh, this plus here means it's uh, up to the choice of Turing machine. So it's up to a constant offset, which which is a problem that I'm going to brush under the carpet now. Um, so if I'm willing to make this assumption, this independence of cause and mechanisms, or more generally, uh, the independence of causal mechanisms, we can generalize this to larger systems. And then it turns out we can prove that the uh, the Kolmogorov complexity, so the description complexity of the state as it evolves over time uh, cannot decrease. So the entropy, if you're willing to accept Kolmogorov complexity as a proxy of entropy, which uh, is, is uh, uh, not unpopular in fundamental physics, then uh, uh, you get a version of the second law of thermodynamics. And, uh, and this is just a picture of uh, give it, to give you some intuition about this assumption in a completely different domain. This is uh, to give you intuition in the domain of, of vision. So uh, so here we have uh, uh, what's called a Boucher chair. So you see this is the Boucher chair. It's of, obviously it's not a chair. But if you look through a, a specific uh, from a specific position at the chair, then it actually looks like a chair. So it's a case where visual perception fails us. So why does it fail us? It fails us because an assumption is violated. And the assumption that's violated is uh, this formula, this independent causal mechanisms principle, the assumption that the cause generative process is composed of autonomous, autonomous modules that do not inform or influence each other. And in particular here, the assumption that's violated is that the structure of the thing that we're seeing, so if you want the probability distribution of the world, uh, What's violated is that this is not independent of our perception process, in particular, the viewing direction. So our perception process, if you want, that's the conditional of percept given the world, should normally be independent of the world. But if this is violated, if we look through this hole, then perception fails because we see something that's not there. Um, I think I'm going to uh, briefly... Uh, skip this uh, slide. So that's just an example uh, of the independence assumption in, in, a, in a weather uh, uh, data set. Uh, we can, if you want, we can get back to it in the discussion. And rather uh, just summarize now in formulas where do we stand now. So we said uh, in a causal model, there's a joint distribution that can be factorized in a specific and nice way with one term for each variable given its parents. Uh, each of these terms we think of as a causal mechanism. These are the mechanisms that generate the statistical dependencies. And we have the independent causal mechanisms principle that tells us that changing one of these guys does not change the other ones. So the other ones remain invariant if we just change one. So in particular, we, we can make local interventions on one mechanism and they don't change the other things. And also knowing one of them should not give us information about the other ones. 
And, uh, and then we can make an assumption that's related to this. Uh, and the assumption you could think of as a generalization of the IID assumption. So in the IID assumption, we'll say we have a distribution, our training set comes from this distribution, the test set comes from the same one, that's it. So now we make a slight generalization and we'll say, that if there's a distribution shift happening in the real world and we move from one system to a, a related system, then we will assume that that shift only acts sparsely on the right-hand side. So only a few of them should change, but most of them should remain invariant. And that's a relaxation. Um, now, in principle, you could also have other factorizations uh, of the data of the joint distribution. So this is the causal one. Uh, uh, other ones could, for instance, you can write the joint distribution like this. Mathematically, that's always possible. Um, the difference is these objects here, they don't have a, for those of you, this is a possible uh, mathematical notion of exchangeability, which is a fundamental thing in the foundations of probability, in particular for Bayesians. And the bottom line is that it's going to be that in the exchangeable case, if we have exchangeable data, but not IID, so exchangeable is a broader class of uh, data generating mechanisms, then uh, we can identify a causal structure from the data. So in a, in a certain way, exchangeable data, even though it's sort of satisfies less assumptions than IID data, uh, can be richer or more useful uh, when it comes to causality. Um, so uh, so exchange, what is exchangeability? It means that we have a sequence of random variables such that their order doesn't matter. So joint distribution over any n such uh, random variables is invariant under any perpetration of these n variables. And then the definitive theorem uh, tells us that such exchangeable random variables can always be written uh, in this form, so we can always uh, uh, pretend that really there exists a random variable theta that has a certain distribution uh, such that this exchangeable sequence, which may not be IID, is at least conditionally IID given theta. So that means we can think of a generative process where we first draw theta and then we draw the other ones given theta, uh, which means they factorize in this way. So that's uh, uh, the standard definity theorem. It's sometimes used to justify uh, Bayesian inference. Uh, um, people could say, well, even if we don't know the prior, if the data is exchangeable, we can pretend that there is some kind of uh, prior distribution over theta, and this is the real data generating model. Now, um, we have generalized this first uh, to bivariate data. And in this case, we have, um, uh, we have pairs of X and Y, and we assume that we have an exchangeable sequence of such pairs. And then we'll make an additional assumption, which is now our ICM assumption. And uh, it, it, it reads like this. And uh, this means that uh, given it's direct, so, so now we consider X n plus one, uh, uh, given it's direct parents uh, here, X n, um, we will not gain more information about the uh, targets yn by knowing an additional input point xn plus one. So we're interested in the relationship from x to y. And uh, uh, if we are given an additional input, it doesn't tell us anything uh, that helps us predict the outputs from the inputs. So um, you can you can see that this is an assumption that corresponds to saying that the input distribution or having an additional point from the input distribution doesn't tell us anything about the conditional of y given n. Uh, so this, this would be the ICM assumption corresponding uh, uh, to the ca causal structure x causing y. And it turns out under this assumption, we can prove that there are two random variables, uh, uh, theta and psi, and two distributions such that we get this kind of decomposition of the joint distribution. And this now uh, uh, corresponds uh, to a structure where we have uh, we have the, the, the cause mechanism, which is parameterized by this prior over theta. And then we have the mechanism of why, sort of x how x causes y, and this is parameterized by a separate uh, distribution over psi. And the fact that these two distributions now factorize uh, is now interpreted as saying that the cause and the mechanism are independent. And we can generalize the same uh, to, uh, uh, to the D variable uh, case also. So that's a nice uh, factorization, uh, but I would like to now uh, 
move on and show you my first i want to show you my favorite application and then i want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing now and why we are interested now in what we call causal representation learning so the, the application is uh, one in astronomy so it's an application on the kepler space tele on data from the kepler space telescope so this is the position of our solar system in the galaxy so this is a uh, 100 billion stars. This is one tiny star, uh, our sun, our solar system. And uh, we had this space telescope, Kepler, which was staring at one patch of Milky Way for several years. Now it's staring at this patch, uh, searching for exoplanet transit. Exoplanet transit means there's a star somewhere far away that periodically slightly changes in brightness because it is partly eclipsed by one of its planets. Now we don't see the planets directly, but we can sometimes see these periodic eclipses. And they're very small events because planets tend to be much smaller than stars, of course. Now we're looking for that, but unfortunately we can't see it directly. So what we see is these brightness changes over time. And these brightness changes are affected not just by the physical system out there, uh, but also by our instrument, because our instrument, it's even it's even though it's trying to stare exactly at the same patch of Milky Way, uh, it it has slight errors, uh, shifts around. That means that some of the pixels, or each of these curves here, corresponds to one pixel. Some of the pixels may get dimmer over time; others get brighter over time. Uh, and interestingly, uh, if we now ask ourselves, so is this uh, the fact that these get darker and these get brighter? Is that something physical, or where does it come from? Uh, then the answer is it comes from the instrument because we can see the same thing also in the signals of other stars. So now we take another star that might be light years away from this one. So this is all real data. And then we see, oh, some pixels are getting dimmer, others are getting brighter. And probably this can just be explained by the telescope having shifted slightly. Now, how do we uh, remove this effect uh, from the, of the telescope? Because what we really want is the astrophysical signal. So what we are, what we came up with is uh, the following idea. We said the the telescope is looking at hundreds of thousands of stars. Now we take the take those other stars that are sufficiently far away, such that there's no light leakage on the CCD, etc. And then we try to explain the signals from our stars as best as we can using machine learning, uh, given uh, the other stars as features. So we we learn a regression. Uh, um, a high dimensional regression, I try to do the best possible job. And then we remove the signal, the part of the signal that we can explain, we remove it in the correct way. And then we can show empirically, but also theoretically under certain assumptions. So there's a certain additivity assumption, certain assumption about completeness of information. We can show that if we remove the regression of our star from the other stars, uh, what we're going to get is that the ast the astrophysical signal up to a constant offset. So that's quite surprising, and we have a, also a generalization. I'm not going to go into details on that, but we so we did this and we found a set of exoplanets uh, around 2025. 20, uh, most of them were confirmed using other methods now afterwards, and uh, one of them was particularly interesting. Uh, it was called K218b. It was interesting because. Uh, it, uh, the characteristics of the star and its distance to the star were such that in principle liquid water was possible. So this is a, a star that's in this Goldilocks uh, zone, not too warm, not too cold. Sorry, that the planet is in this zone, not too warm, not too cold, uh, which was nice. Uh, but it became much nicer a few years ago when another team found out that on that planet, we first didn't notice this was our planet or actually my astronomy collaborator, told me, so I didn't notice. Uh, someone else on that other planet uh, found uh, traces of water in the atmosphere using other methods. So this was the first such uh, potentially habitable planet where uh, water was found. So I want to go back to the fundamental problems. Uh, I told you about how to bridge different levels from ODEs to causal models, from causal models to the statistic models, from causal models to algorithmic models. Uh, another interesting transfer problem is how to get from one statistical model to another one. And I want to uh, give you a few pointers of related problems that I think are very important. So one is that the, this, this transfer problem where we may have learned uh, multivariate density 
and we can write it causally like this. Now, I suppose it drifts to a related, uh, slightly different, but different density, uh, P2. And now we want to ask the questions, uh, what do we have to observe to learn P2, given that we've already learned P1? And, uh, and of course, the answer is if we know nothing about this drift, then we have to observe everything. We have to start from scratch. Um, but if we're willing to assume that they are related to each other in the sense that they share the same underlying causal structure and uh, and that the sparse mechanism shift hypothesis is true, then uh, uh, we're in a much better situation because we only would have to, uh, we could reuse most of the causal conditionals over here and we would only have to relearn those that uh, uh, we only need to observe those variables that appear in the conditions that have changed. So that's a dramatic simplification of the program. And uh, related to this, uh, I mentioned before this topic of out of variable generalization. So there's a related question which asks, given samples only for marginals over subsets, so we never see the joint distribution, we just see samples from marginals over variable subsets. Can this sometimes allow us to learn the overall model nevertheless? And there's a, there's a trivial answer and there's a non-trivial one. The trivial one is, uh, but even though I think uh, it's trivial and people haven't talked about much, much about this, um, the trivial one is if we know the graph and uh, then it's enough to have marginals such that each causal conditional is completely included in one of the marginals. So for instance, if we uh, observed the variables for each causal conditional, we observed exactly those variables. So the Xi and all its parents jointly, then we can estimate that conditional. And if, if this is true for every conditional, we have the joint distribution. So that means we, we, we get by with having much, much lower dimensional uh, uh, data. But there's also a, a non-trivial setting which we've analyzed in a, in a recent paper, uh, which I'm pointing to here. Uh, where we need less than that. Now, uh, I want to maybe use the last five minutes or so uh, to motivate causal representation learning. So I talked about symbolic AI, uh, where the symbols are provided, the rules are provided. Um, I talked about machine learnings, where we learn representation and rules from the data. I talked about causality, which you could say is derived from classic AI. We also assume that the variables are provided a priori. What we really would like to do is merge these two things and automatically learn representations uh, that support all these tasks, um, but where we're not given the variables where we learn those representations. So a machine learning approach, uh, to a true machine learning and representation learning approach to causality. And we've worked on a number of different methods um, and I, I don't have the time to go into them, how to uh, uh, um, how to do this, how to learn such representations, how to encourage independent mechanisms. Uh, we have uh, work on, on connections uh, to uh, uh, seem clear uh, self-supervised learning methods to generate counterfactual images. We have methods that are related to sparse mechanism shift uh, to interventions uh, on latent representations. So uh, we have methods that connect scene, generate causal scene models. Uh, so this is related to object-centric learning where we have object-centric scene models where we think about the overall graph and how to manipulate such scenes. So uh, in, in one of our first works on this, uh, we automatically learn these models uh, given uh, uh, images from this aquarium uh, uh, data set. We can learn models where we can manipulate the number of objects, the identities, the positions, of course, that, doesn't look as realistic as what we can currently do with the best possible generative models. So this is a picture that I did a few days for a Christmas lecture that I had to give. So that looks, at first sight, that looks relatively compelling. This was generated with stable diffusion. But if you look at the images in detail, so I'm going to zoom into this image, then you can see that actually some of the things look a bit scary. The faces are not uh, all compelling. Uh, some of the people look in this direction, some look in the opposite direction. So the system doesn't really have an understanding of what's going on. It doesn't even have an understanding that these are individual separate entities, these humans. Uh, it just generates the whole thing in one. So there's no causal generation process there. There's also no causal manipulation process possible. And the same holds true also uh, in, in causal models of music, which is a problem that we've worked on. 
uh, quite a bit. So I, just as an example of what's possible there, I'll play a little bit. So this is uh, so this is a generative model with latent diffusion trained on the on the directly on the waveform, and then we randomly generate. So there's no conditioning going on here. These are just random samples from the mm -hmm. same same model. Here, finally. So it, uh, it is relatively compelling, but we don't have very good control. And uh, I'll show you a few images of how we are trying to get control. This is an image uh, now back in the visual domain. Here we are trying to use uh, a segmentation mask for control. So we give a text prompt and a segmentation mask, and then we generate this image. And the segmentation mask actually was derived from a real image, um, but we only used the text prompt and this mask as input, and that's why this generated image looks quite different, but it looks it looks plausible and it's hard to tell whether this is more compelling or this one. So this is a paper that's coming out this week at the NeurIPS conference. We can also use it to generate a, a condition on a combination of text and an object which is uh, given by some example images. So here we say, generate a bowl with a wheat field in the background and the bowl is supposed to look like these examples here. And then we get this kind of thing. So um, I think this is already moving in encouraging ways towards a finer grained control, uh, causal or interventional control of generative models. I think this is the future to have generative models that are more causal. Let me skip this. Um, we are currently, this is uh, not yet published, uh, but it's on the archive, I believe, or at least it's on this web page. We have a model where we generate three-dimensional compositional scenes uh, where objects are generated separately, uh, given a scene graph, which we can generate automatically using a language model. And then we get uh, this kind of composite uh, scenes, which I think are, are quite promising. Um, and the, the long-term goal really is to have a causal representation. So uh, we have a representation of an image which not just includes everything in the image, but it includes it in a structured way such that we can hypothetically intervene and think about what will happen if this chicken eats all these, uh, uh, these berries, what will happen to the other objects, how are they connected mechanistically to each other. Um, and that's uh, then related to the fundamental question of what is a representation. But I think I'm probably going to skip this and rather leave a bit of time, maybe give you a few pointers. These are additional papers that are coming out at New Year's this week, uh, where we study the relationship between causal representations and independent component analysis, because you can you can view causal representation learning in a certain way as a generalization of independent component analysis. Uh, we also have a paper coming out at the New Year's, uh, which is looking at large language models uh, and causality, which is looking at the question of um, how much causal understanding is there in a large language model? Is it even possible that they learn causal representations without explicit causal objectives? Um, so this is how to assay uh, whether a representation is causal and a result that is that if you ask hard questions, then uh, even GPT-4 has a rather limited understanding of, of causality. So I want to uh, conclude with uh, um, two pictures uh, about how we can think of causal representation learning. There are two instantiations. The first one is the AI instantiation, if you want. So that means a causal representation uh, learned for AI uh, is something that we can think of as a causal world model for an intelligent agent. So it's a representation that not just includes these objects, but also what we do with these objects. Um, and that, that then will allow us to perform uh, thinking in the sense of acting in an imagined space. So a causal representation is an imagined space that contains the notion of action. Uh, and I think that's a necessary precondition for thinking. And the second one is an instantiation that I didn't talk much about, but I think that's equally important. And that's the data science instantiation. I believe that uh, causal representations uh, will allow us to build uh, what one could call causal digital twins of complex systems. 
And those uh, would decompose a complex system into mechanisms. And these mechanisms can, can be estimated using different methods. Some of the mechanisms can be learned from machine learning from data. Some might be uh, based on simulations. Some might be uh, transferred from, from other problems, or we might have prior knowledge, or we might be able to do them analytically. We, we may not have any, any single joint observation, but we don't need that if we have this modular approach. And uh, one example that's going in this direction is a paper that we've recently published where we built such a causal digital twin for uh, COVID-19 and the effect of vaccinations based on the data that was available from Israel. And with this, we can do hypothetical interventions. We can ask uh, what if the vaccines had been prioritized differently? What if instead of COVID, we would have had the Spanish flu with a different risk profile, etc. So I think uh, with this, uh, I want to conclude and uh, uh, tell you that in machine learning, we started with exploiting correlations, doing pattern recognitions. The next level, I think, is now going on. It's, it's understanding the effect of interventions that allows us to do reasoning and thinking and causality and, and to do it in a way that's uh, ideally combined so that we automatically learn the right representations. And once we do that, we're not done because uh, there's another important level to intelligence, uh, which we haven't really tackled yet, uh, which I think is that uh, we really, even if we understand what will be the effect of the intervention, that doesn't uh, free us from actually choosing the right interventions. And those are the, neither questions of pattern recognitions nor of causality, but questions of ethics. So with that, uh, I would like to encourage you all to think about uh, what you do with machine learning, try to make the world a better place with it. And I'll thank my team for all the work that contributed to this. Thank you very much. No, Thank you, happy. Professor Sholkov. Uh, I invite questions from the audience now. Thank you very much, Professor Sholkov. May I invite questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sholkov. Thank you for bringing the presentation. Uh, Vickers. Um, so, when uh, you are talking about decomposition, decomposition theory, um, maybe it's key point for your um, uh, argumentation. Arguments. Um, is it possible to apply this theorem to non Markovian processes? Um, so, I, I had a hard time understanding, but I think you're asking whether the decomposition of a joint distribution into uh, quantum components also applies to the non-Parkovian setting. Right. Yeah, so the, so the, that's a good question. So everything becomes more complicated in the non, so for the audience, the non-Parkovian setting would be, correspond to the case where the uh, noise variables are not independent. So in a, in a sense where we are observing a system that is too small uh, and that is not Markovian, therefore, uh, so in that case, everything becomes more difficult. Uh, oftentimes, what people then in that case try to do is that they don't even uh, try to give you sort of the, the true decomposition, but they will just say, I'm now interested in identifying a particular causal effect so uh, 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 or a distribution of one variable, given an intervention on another variable. And then they study questions under which conditions this can be done even if uh, the overall assumption of all noises being independent is not satisfied. So there's a significant amount of work on that, uh, but it's it's a hard problem. So it's a good question, hard problem, uh, many open questions related to it. It's not, personally, it's not my focus. I'm, I'm, so this is more something that the, the classical causality community does, whereas I now see my direction more in trying to, to uh, make causality useful for machine learning and, and merge ideas from causality with, with machine learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Maybe uh, in that case, I'll ask uh, 
uh, one or two. So I was quite interested in this, your definite, the causal definitive theorem. And uh, you had assumed the binary data. So I'm sure there is a version of that for non-binary data, where the parameter would be replaced by some sort of a sigma field or something. Yeah, so that's a good question. And uh, obviously you paid attention extremely well. So you saw that this was restricted to binary data. So, so we did that because traditionally also the classical de definitive theorem is, is proved uh, initially for uh, binary data and then generalized to continuous data. So, uh, so we also started with binary data. We didn't, uh, we didn't bother to do this generalization. We, we expect, or we don't see a reason why it shouldn't be possible, but that's also something that uh, maybe still should be done. And it's, it's related to, so there are some related works also in the physics community, uh, quantum information theory. People uh, have similar kinds of challenges, but I think it's an interesting problem to look at, yeah. I have a related question. You had then very interestingly applied it to data from astronomy. And if I follow the uh, slides, then there is uh, the data is sparse in that case. Because you said that the revolutions come and when you see the, uh, you know, the uh, eclipses occur very infrequently. Yeah. So yeah. Is, sparsity, is sparsity a problem? I mean, how do you tackle this? Yeah, so in this case, uh, so I, uh... I didn't give all the details. So what we actually do is we we predict uh, uh, the intensity of one pixel that belongs to a certain star uh, at a given point in time from many other pixels that belong to other stars at the same point in time. But in addition, we find that, uh, uh, and that's now coming to your point about sparsity, um, since the events, the actual events, these transits, uh, they occur very sparsely. A typical a transit might be, uh, for instance, if you were to observe the Earth from space and you are somehow aligned with our solar system so you can see Earth transits from the distance, then you would find an Earth transit uh, takes a few hours uh, and, uh, and it happens once a year. So it's a very sparse event in this sense. So what we find is that when we want to predict a given pixel in terms of other pixels. So we want to explain a pixel from other pixels. And um, we can do even better if in addition to using the other pixels as features, we also use the pixel itself, but its future and its past. So if we, uh, uh, so we, if we, so we are allowed to use not just other pixels, but also our own pixel in the future and past, as long as we keep a temporal distance. So for instance, if we knew that the events we're looking for only take a few hours, then anything that happens uh, at plus one day or more in the future or minus one day or more in the past also contains no causal information about the transit itself. So therefore we can use them as features and whatever we can explain away using those features also helps us. So in practice, we actually use both kinds of information. Uh, so in this sense, we actually uh, therefore exploit the fact that it's a sparse, a sparse signal. It's actually useful for us. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Professor Bernard Skorka for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. And my regards to India. Enjoy it. I close the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bose, for chairing the session for us. Now, I will request Professor Nikhil Ranjan Pal of Indian Statistical Institute to please come up on stage and felicitate Professor Bose with a memento. and I are retiring at the same same time next year. So, same day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have our IAPR public lecture. 
entitled India's First Solar Space Observatory, Aditya L1, and Scope of AI, by Professor Deepankar Banerjee of Archibhatto Research Institute of Observational Sciences, India. Now, to chair the session, I would like to request Professor Shukrutik Pal of Indian Statistical Institute to please come on stage and chair the session for us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this IAPR public lecture of the 10th International Conference on Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning. Uh, this is Supratik Pal. I am from the Physics and Applied Mathematics Unit of ISI. I do a little bit of astrophysics cosmology that involves data analysis a little bit. So I think I qualify to be assessing here. Uh, 